Koshevalite, Rabosai, let's get started. <laughs> I'd like to welcome everyone to our third annual Eva Loki Yiddish lecture. Um, today's lecture is Dr. Jessica Kierzain. <laughs> There's an intense uh, debate about how exactly to pronounce that name, but for the, for the rest of today, we're going to say Kierzain. Um, Dr. Jessica Kierzain is a scholar of Yiddish studies specializing in questions of race, gender, and regionalism in American Yiddish fiction. She has translated three Yiddish novels by Miriam Karpilov. Um, a Provincial Newspaper and Other Stories, Syracuse University Press 2023, Judith, Farlog Press 2022, and the now notorious Diary of a Lonely Girl or the Ballad, Battle Against Free Love, Syracuse University Press 2020. Dr. Kurzane's work to translate Yiddish women writers was recently featured in the New York Times. So after receiving her PhD in Yiddish studies from Columbia University in 2017, Kierzain became the assistant instructional professor in Yiddish at the University of Chicago, and she also serves as the editor-in-chief of Ingeweb, a journal of Yiddish studies, which is something that some of us have a passing familiarity <laughs> with. So I'll put out this plug because I pulled out Jessica's bio from the lecture, which is that she's available for lectures, presentations, <laughs> one-time classes, freelance translations, and editing work. So please tell your friends. Um, but if you prefer to kind of stay local, uh, we have another Yiddish lecture coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, Dr. Jeremiah Lockwood uh, will be giving the Sumpf lecture on February 20th at noon. That will be here. Yeah, in this building 360. In building 360. And then at 5 p.m. he will be giving a concert, um, Yiddish jazz concert, and at 5 p.m. in the faculty club, and there will be drinks. So, and food. Uh, and food. Um, today there's chocolate. Very important. <laughs> so please, uh, thank you, Dr. Kirzain. We're excited to hear your presentation. Jeremiah's lecture sounds amazing. Maybe I'll come back for that. Okay, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for this invitation. I'm very excited to be here and talk about my favorite subject, Miriam Karpilov. Um, here she is, Miriam Karpilov. Miriam Karpilov, born in 1888, she died in 1956, was a prolific Yiddish writer and editor known for her sharp, sardonic gaze on the world of Yiddish, its sexism, and its hypocrisies. I've been reading and translating her work for several years now, uh, and I'm going, I'm here to tell you about her life and her writing because it is gutsy, fiercely independent, and funny, and strikingly modern and fresh, even a hundred years later. Her work tells us something important about the kind of writing that Yiddish readers encountered in their daily lives, not in the vaunted pages of a literary journal or compiled by critics and educators into anthologies for future generations to enjoy, but in the newspapers where they consumed ideas about the world and looked to have their world reflected back to them in ways that were timely, relevant, and accessible. So I'm going to walk you through Miriam Karpilov's life and as I do, I will stop and tell you about some of her writing in greater detail and read from it and give you a bit of a whirlwind tour of her fiction. Um, as I do this, my goal is to help you understand why I think this writer is so important to recover as a leading voice in Yiddish letters. But before I do that, I want to start a little bit from the end of Karpilov's life and think about uh, legacy and about recovery. In recent years, <laughs> Miriam Karpilov has sort of arrived through my translations into some new prominence in Yiddish literary history. Her writing is now being taught in courses in Yiddish and Jewish literature around the country. I'm frankly astonished by this, by this uh, reception. Uh, but it's already maybe becoming easy to forget that Karpilov's arrival is a very delayed one. Karpilov was widely published and read in her own lifetime, but even by the time her literary production had slowed down in her later years, there was virtually no mention of her in literary histories or in literary criticism. And from the 1950s until the 2020s, she had effectively gone more or less unread. Even taking into account the status of Yiddish itself as a language whose writers found drastically decreasing readership in these decades, the lack of attention to Karpilov in the mid to late 20th century is significant, and it's worth asking why she and other writers of Yiddish prose fiction in a similar vein were so little regarded. I believe it was the result of two overlapping factors, gender and genre. 
In, in Karpilov's archive, which is housed at the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research in New York, one can find two handwritten lists in Karpilov's own handwriting of every single work she ever published. It's as though she expected some scholar to come back to her at some later date, knowing that she was crucial to understanding the history of American Yiddish literature. These were the documents on which she recorded her self-understanding as a writer of significance and preserved her writing uh, that might otherwise have seemed ephemeral, ephemeral to her, as much of her work was published in newspapers that would have long since gone out of circulation by the time she wrote this list, which I don't have a date for it, but I think was in the 50s, in the early 50s, when she wrote these all down. If we pause to look carefully at these lists, we will see that on one of them is written, one of them was written on a stationery on which is printed the words, Miriam Karpilov, authoress. Elsewhere, on the cover of one of her scrapbooks, one can find an image of Miriam Karpilov clipped from a newspaper with the label, Miriam Karpilov, die berühmte Schriftstellerin, the famous woman writer, a title that she likely bore in many such advertisements. Many of you may have paused when you saw the title of my talk today and my use of the now outdated word authoress, but I chose the word carefully to echo Karpilov's own language and the way she was represented in her own time. She embraced this title. It was a point of pride for her. This document helps us see how she wanted to be remembered as a prolific, accomplished authoress. So what does it mean for a famous woman, to be a famous woman writer, to be a famous authoress? An authoress is not merely an author with a feminine gender identity. An authoress is a term that comes with particular connotations. It has a certain dramatic flair, like Miriam Karpilov. One pictures a, a well-dressed woman in a sweeping gown, and Karpilov indeed often looked the part. But an authoress is also a writer who conforms to expectations about the form and subject for what women wrote. Writing about women, writing in ways that emphasize her own experiences as a woman, and with a special emphasis on romantic love, relationships between men and women, and among women, writing that is, in a word, womanly. Such writing, targeted toward women readers, was often read as of lower status, or what we might call middle brow, hanging between the brows, as it were. Um, this genre of literature, the middle brow, has received a lot of critical attention for its prominence in early 20th century print culture recently. Think of Dorothy Parker as a prominent example in English, who I think is very similar to Miriam Karpilov. And many magazine writers in this category went on to be screenwriters in Hollywood, continuing their interest in feeding public hunger for accessible, contemporary, realistic narratives written to entertain as well as to provoke. Such writing is characterized by its orientation toward the present moment, its immediacy, which in turn may not lend itself to a lasting legacy. In Karpilov's case, such writing often meant entering into a literary battle of the sexes, in which the middle-brow writer, the authoress, used humor to punch up at and ridicule the male literary establishment. It's no wonder, then, that she was easily written out of literary histories that would rather not be plagued by the attention she gave to the hypocrisy of the male intellectuals, editors, writers, and lovers that Karpilov encountered in her lifetime as a famous Yiddish authoress. To take an example of the kind of text that made Miriam Karpilov so entertaining in her lifetime, but might have contributed to her becoming so quickly forgotten after her death. A few years ago, I published a translation of an unpublished humorous sketch by Karpilov. The translation appeared in the Digital Yiddish Theater Project, a research consortium and a digital humanities project. The sketch, titled Theater, is undated, but presumably given its content was written in maybe the late 40s or the early 50s, after Karpilov had moved into something like retirement, leaving the Yiddish literary world of New York to live with her brother in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The sketch offers a window into Karpilov's struggles as a woman in the male-dominated world of Yiddish literature and culture, problems that she explores consistently in her published writing and in her personal correspondence. These problems include expectations about the appropriate genres and subjects for women's writing, they should be domestic or romance, as well as male editors and here directors not taking her work seriously or looking to take advantage of her. I'm gonna read you an excerpt in which a Yiddish woman writer pitches a play about partisans, resistance fighters during the Holocaust, 
to a producer and director of Yiddish theater who want to take the play for, for free, but then utterly transform it into the kind of entertainment they feel will be lucrative. She had a captivating voice, calm and gentle, that stroked and rocked them to sleep. Seeing the effect her voice was having on them, she raised it higher and louder. She played the role of her heroine. The partisans in the forest were asleep and didn't see the danger. The murderous Nazis were approaching. The heroine, the heroic partisan, cried out, wake up, wake up, you have to get up, they're coming, shoot, shoot. She was so absorbed in the role that she seemed to have frightened herself with her screams. Even more than she, the men who were listening to her were startled. They leapt to their feet. Their eyes darted around the room. Huh? What? Where's the fire? What happened? The whole world is on fire, the playwright lamented in a tragic voice. The whole world is on fire and we're asleep. Hearing her answer, answer they calmed down. <laughs> they exchanged glances and then they asked her to keep reading. She read on. In order to prove to her that they weren't asleep, they interrupted her with questions that only served to demonstrate that they had no idea what her skit was about. What happens next? asked the star director. What happens after he forces her against a wall? What happens with the courtesan? You mean the partisan, she corrected him. <laughs> oh yes, the partisan. She bears his child, doesn't she? No. <laughs> Why not? Because she refuses. That's a shame. <laughs> a child creates such pathos. It can really liven up a play. It's what the audience is like. And it's a good place to add some music, asserted the musical director. <laughs> you can have a lullaby or a lament. And what about a dance number in the forest after they beat their enemies, huh? This isn't an operetta or a burlesque, the playwright cried. It's a tragedy, a memorial to the victims, to the martyrs, to all those who were killed. She was overcome with emotion and couldn't say any more. She finished reading. She sat, exhausted. She silently wet her lips. The musical director did too. The star director removed his hands, which he had placed over his eyes, and wiped his brow. Well, well, he said. Hmm. I see that it's a current events piece. Not bad, not bad. There's, of course, room for improvements. The forest, the concentration camp, Nazis and courtesans, partisans. Oh yes, partisans, lady partisans and male ones too, men, women and children, young, like young trees in a forest full of murderers and thieves. What an image, captivating, colossal, stupendous. I think the passage is fascinating for a number of reasons. It lampoons the hypocrisies of a Yiddish arts world that is more interested in money making than meaning making. And it sheds light on the way that Jewish heroism during the Holocaust had already become a recognizable trope, even in this case, perhaps a hackneyed one, early after the war. It's not only a story about women, although the male directors see the playwright as a lady writer and treat her with less respect and seek to take advantage of her to exploit and change her writing as a result of her gender. They refer to her several times as a dama with a drama a dame, a lady with a drama, which they see as a sensational, a sensational, marketable product beyond the content of the play itself. The story is at once about the business of theater and is about the theatrical nature of modern Yiddish culture in America, which appears to be only acting as though all is well while Jews in Europe are living out atrocities. That is to say, it starts out with a critique about the treatment of women writers, but is ultimately an even broader critique about the kind of culture that male cultural producers propagate, gender aside. These issues are interconnected. The male director's expectations of what a lady writer is and does are blinders that prevent them from seeing the seriousness of the issues that the woman writer brings to the fore. In the story, Karpilov uses her biting wit and her signature ironic tone, a tone she employs in most of her public work across genres, to depict Yiddish theater and Yiddish culture in America um, in general as an insincere and irrelevant sham that cannot appropriately speak to the urgencies of its moment, in part because it is crippled by its own sexism. Let's stop and notice, this is a tightly constructed, very funny short story that to my knowledge never found a publisher. Not only was the story forgotten to literary history, it was never known in the first place. To be an authoress then, at least for Karpilov, was to have an experience of writing in which your work was underpaid 
and undervalued. Like the narrator in the story, she was often writing under demeaning demands that the topics be less earnest and more sexy, with know-it-all editors who were eager to improve the story to meet their expectations for it. And sometimes her work wasn't published at all. An authoress not only embraced writing about women, she was pub punished for it. My task as a translator then has been to expose these circumstances by researching Karpolov herself and all her writing about the conditions of her labor, a consistent topic of hers, and to write the record of Yiddish literary history by reinscribing Karpolov's place in it in a way that was denied to her, to her in her own lifetime, as it was for so many other women writers. And so there are really two layers to, we'll call it the feminism of my translation work. On the one hand, Miriam Karpolov's work was engaged with representing the contradictions and challenges of women's romantic and working lives, and my translation reproduces that work for new readers. That's one layer. Uh, but there is also a broader oops, context, uh, one about literary recovery in the face of erasure. Despite her prolific output in the Yiddish press, Karpolov's obituary in Der Tag, a newspaper for which she had served as one of the founding writers, is very spare. It describes her as having written novels for newspapers without giving the titles or names of the publications, explains that she stood close to the labor movement without detailing the nature of her political involvement, um, the sparsity of information available, and it's really quite surprising to me because, as I said, she, she wrote for the tug, but they don't mention that she was one of their writers. Um, the sparsity of information available in publications, her work received almost no critical attention in her lifetime or thereafter, um, means that I have to rely on, personal, on her personal archive and letters as well as her published work, including her fiction, to reconstruct her life and career. This is typical for women who wrote in Yiddish, and often for women's writing in general, which is undervalued in its own time, and therefore harder to find, harder to read and learn about today. That's what makes my translation work something other than bringing a text admired in one language to an audience who wishes to access it in another, something we might more typically think of as the task of a translator, for instance, what an English translator of Tolstoy or Flaubert might do. Rather, it's a work of literary recovery that helps set the record straight about women who wrote in Yiddish, that they existed, that they wrote valuable and interesting works of literature. And, oops, and this translation is part of a veritable wave of translations and scholarship that are now making it all but impossible to think of Yiddish literature as a field occupied solely by men. Though little more than a decade ago, syllabi of Yiddish literature were likely to include only a handful of female identifying poets if they included women at all. And this is just a small sampling of the very many uh, books that have come out in the past five years or so that are translations of Yiddish literature written by women. Uh, it also joins in a broader effort toward feminist literary recovery beyond Yiddish, the strength of which relies, as literary critic Joanna Scutz explains, not with the return of a single neglected voice, but with a chorus. All of this has been, forgive me, a very long preface to the substance of my talk, which is to walk you through Miriam Love's life, interweaving her, her work into that biographical sketch. So it's by way of saying, let's take a look at this authoress and the phenomenon of the authoress and take her seriously because she deserves it and because she was denied it. So with that, I will back up just a little bit. Miriam Karpilov was born in 1888 near Minsk in what is now Belarus, uh, and was then in the Russian Empire, among the middle ch of children in a family of 10 children. She immigrated to the U.S. in 1905, where she lived in Bridgeport, Connecticut, along with several of her siblings, as well as in Harlem and in the Seagate neighborhood of Brooklyn. One of the first of Karpilov's publications was her 1911 novel, Judith, Judas, here's my translation, um, of all her prolific output, this very early piece was the piece that Karpolov identified with most strongly. Writing to her friend Rose Schomer Bachelis near the end of her life, Karpolov recalls that your mother used to call me Judas instead of Miriam. I liked it. It's no wonder that Judith, Judas, was close to Karpolov's heart. The protagonist of Judith immigrates to America at about the same age and in the same historical moment that Karpolov herself left her parents and home in search of safety and opportunity. The events of the novel are drawn from Karpolov's own experiences of coming of age amidst political upheaval. Karpolov emigrated from Minsk to the United States in 1905 
and her fierce lifelong commitment to labor Zionist, li Zionism emerged from the heady and desperate atmosphere of Jewish self-defense organizing during a time of rising anti-Jewish violence. The same kind of organizing that her title character Judith participates in following a pogrom in her own town. Like Judith, Karpolov continued to correspond with and to send money home to her family upon arrival in America. And like Judith, Karpolov was, prolific, was a prolific and impassioned writer of letters. Karpolov's debut as a writer is intertwined with her early political involvement. Upon settling in Connecticut, Karpolov became secretary for the Bridgeport branch of the Poilate Sion labor Zionist movement, for which her close friend and correspondent A. Halpern served as president. Although she had already begun publishing in a few newspapers, it appears that Karpolov was recruited and encouraged in her writing by Kalman Marmer, a fellow Poilatsion activist, writer, and editor, who was aiming to develop women writers for um, Der Yiddischer Kämpfer, the, an organ of the Poilatsion labor Zionist movement, or at least he credited himself with her development. In his memoirs, Marmer recalls Karpolov as the tall Bridgeport photographic retoucher who sent in excellent reports on political meetings. And on the strength of this journalism, Marmer encouraged her to write journalistic personal essays and descriptive pieces eventually leading to, or at least encouraging, her career largely as a writer of serialized newspaper novels and short stories. Although the process that led to the publication of Judith is not entirely clear, certain events are clear from her correspondence. Karpolov submitted an epistolary novel, which she referred to as The Letters, uh, with some trepidation and doubt about its possible acceptance writing to her sister-in-law, Rebecca, and her best friend about the manuscript when it was still under editorial consideration, she complains it could take him, Marmer, up to a year to read it. He is terribly slow. At every turn, Halpern offered warm encouragement, asking her if her sub submission had met with success. Likewise, Miriam's sister, Dina, anxiously wrote to ask, has Marmer been to see you yet? You must know by now. You can see there's a lot of family correspondence. Also, I said she's a prolific writer of letters. Presumably after a significant wait, Karpolov received a visitor to the boarding room where she was living in Manhattan. Marmer delivered the news in person that her manuscript had been accepted for publication by a small press, Meisel and Company, located on Grand Street. Hers would be the first book by a woman to be published by that press, whose catalog included Yiddish translations of Chekhov, Strindberg, and Ibsen, and the poetry of Morris Vinchevsky. After the book was published, Karpolov's friend Halpern wrote to her, describing seeing the physical volume at her brother Jacob's house. It was very good. The book is much bigger than I would have thought. I wish you much success. This celebratory tone suggests what a novelty it was for Karpolov's name to appear in print, and the extent to which she already knew that she hoped it would be the first of many. The epistolary novel chronicles a relationship over many years as the titular character Judith and her beloved Joseph carry on a secret long-distance romance and plan to smuggle themselves over the border together and make their way to America. Joseph makes a cowardly last-minute decision to remain behind, and Judith doubts Joseph's loyalty, and their pledges of friendship and promises of eternal love go unfulfilled. The letters betray the frustrations of Judith's limited, limited knowledge of Joseph's activities and whereabouts, as well as the stress to their youthful romance caused by anti-Jewish violence, Joseph's political activities, and Judith's emigration. Throughout, Judith expresses her concerns that Joseph's revolutionary involvement ruins her possibilities for a redemptive and joyful love story. A woman in love is a tragic figure in a time when politics is placed above the needs of the individual. I'll just give you a little taste so you can hear what it sounds like uh, from the translation. This is the second letter in the book, April 15th, 1904. My Joseph, how I long to be beside you. I would comfort your fevered head with, the so with soft caresses and beg you to rest. Your parents won't force you to tie yourself down to a career or coerce you into marrying for money. No, they love you too much. You judge them too harshly. Why can't you understand that they want to keep you, uh, keep you with them out of love for you and not to give you up to me? Oh, you wonderful, capricious boy. Do they know about me yet? <laughs> you told them. You did. I understand, Joseph, everything that you didn't write. I understand how much they don't want me. They want a wealthy girl. To what end? They're wealthy enough themselves. In our small town, my family is considered among the most well-off. But compared to yours, no, there shouldn't be rich and poor. Everyone should be equal. 
Do you know what my father said yesterday? He said that one day you'll be a famous man, a great public speaker. Do you remember that one time he was so taken by your speech that he grasped both of your hands and said, young man, we are very much in need of men like you. Older men like me look to young ones like you to carry on our work. But you need to be more careful with your words. We must guard our words in this land of spies and unrest. You stood there and didn't say anything. Everyone stopped talking. You looked into his eyes. Then you lifted your head and swore that you would defend our people to the death. How strong and handsome you were, Joseph. How moving it was to see the two of you united in one purpose. I wanted to hold you in both my arms and kiss you, but I was too shy. Why are we always ashamed to give way to our noblest feelings? Aaron is here. I'm sure he is talking about you. I will listen to what he has to say. So you can see also she's sort of capturing this teenage feelings, teenage romance. In 1914, Harpalove's career appears to really have taken off. She published frequently in satirical newspapers. She wrote jokes, witticism, and sketches, including making fun of the leading Yiddish newspapers of the day. This is a, a pair of jokes that she wrote. You can see at the end it says, um, it's a little bit um, hard to read, but love is her instead of Karpilov, love at the end. Um, and I translated it for you. It's a pair of jokes that demonstrates a few ideas that will persist in Karpilov's writing. The idea of men and women miscommunicating or intentionally speaking past one another. The rhetorical power that women can have over men through flirtation and joking and the role that socioeconomic class has come to play in romantic relationships. It also kind of gives you the sense of the versatility, the kinds of genres that she's writing in, and the way that she kind of, um, I think, wrote in so many genres because she could get paid for it, right? So there's a kind of um, uh, utilitarian part of it as well. Although she would later devote herself entirely to her writing, in these early days, she also worked as a retoucher in several different photography studios. And I believe that she had family members who owned some photography studios. I've seen some writing to um, where she wrote letters to her, her sister-in-law, her cousin, Rebecca, which is addressed to a photography studio. So she was maybe living above it or something. Um, among some of her early journalism are descriptions of this work. Working in a photography studio meant laboring all day, in the dark, with shuttered windows, no fresh air, in a narrow room on an upper floor of a poorly ventilated building. Dark curtains hung over the window panes. In one large studio that Karpilov describes, there were tables in a circle in the middle of the studio. Each table with six stands in a row for six retouchers. And there was one small electric lamp in the middle for them to share because quote, the boss understood how to be economical. The camera operator would take the subject's portrait and then dip the glass in chemicals, dry it, and hand it to a retoucher. Using a sharp pencil, the retoucher would smooth out the imperfections on the subject's face, getting rid of their freckles or wrinkles. Quote, in a wor word, the photograph should look younger and prettier than the subject, Karpilov explains. The retoucher would paint the photographs with India ink, adding details such as the necklace a jealous woman spotted on her next door neighbor, or removing the shadows that had fallen over someone's face when the photograph was taken. Karpilov's writing about these tasks is sometimes quite funny. One customer complained, I'm missing two fingers. They're not missing, they're just bent. Well, paint them in, please. I won't accept a picture without fingers. But most of the writing is deadly serious. Describing the miserable working conditions, Karpilov explains, the workers looked more dead than alive after spending so much time in the dark, poorly maintained room. The floors were soaked in oil, gasoline, and kerosene, Karpilov recalls, at any moment they could go up in flame. There was no elevator, no fire escape, and the stairs were made of thin boards that creaked under your feet. Karpilov makes clear that while the work was backbreaking and eye-spoiling for workers of all stripes, women in the industry faced particular challenges. When she was at work as a retoucherin or a retoucherke, a woman retoucher in the, photography, in the photography studio, Karpilov was often the only woman in the room. This would later also be the case in the offices of the newspapers where she wrote. Karpilov describes the experience of going to work in a studio on Fifth Avenue. They led me into a dark room full of men and I felt as though I had fallen into a foreign land. I had never been alone with so many men before. They looked at me curiously with stolen glances, and one called out, we have ourselves a girl. They made jokes and sexual innuendos and gave her a hard time for not laughing. They insulted her, quote, not only with their tongues, but with their hands and feet. One worker placed his leg so closely against hers that no matter how often she scooted away or asked him to stop, 
to the, um, he kept on going to the amusement of the rest of the workers. Describing her anger, she writes, my pencil broke on the negative because my fist was so tightly clenched. Standing up, Karpolov lifted her chair and threatened, say another word and I'll break this chair over your head. Or at least so she claims in her writing. Karpolov's writing about the photography work displays the same sense of vulnerability and resilience and defiance that readers later came to expect from her writing about romance or about the world of journalism. When Karpolov began serializing Diary of a Lonely Girl in the newspaper Die Wahrheit in 1916, she was finally able not only to have the recognition of a wide audience, but also the stability, oh, who's doing that? Uh, the stability of a regular income. And I suspect this marked the end of her time as a photography worker. Diary of a Lonely Girl is a first person narrative about a woman's life navigating a treacherous dating scene in turn of the 20th century New York. The diary was one of Karpolev's most popular novels. It was serialized in Die Wahrheit in 1916 to 1918 and then published in book form uh, in 1918. Karpolev's work, first, uh, a first person account of a single young woman's dating life, slyly attacks the economic and political inequities facing women. In doing so, it reveals the hypocrisies and societal expectations facing women. Um, at, that the narrator be at once sexually available to free-thinking young men and maintain her respectability according to the mores of nosy landladies. The novel offers a raw, intimate, and personal criticism of radical urban Jewish society's complicity in fashioning a young woman's vulnerable circumstances. The narrator is struggling to figure out whether and how she can participate in a culture of free love in which she is undervalued, used, and discarded. Its insight and wit expose and critique the precarious situation of women in, Amer in Yiddish American youth culture in this period. As Karpolov's narrator reveals, the idea of free love was part of the context of liberatory anti-establishment thinking, including revolt against religious and political authorities who support, supported the establishment of marriage. But together with a politically left loosening of sexual mores, came increased dangers of non-consensual sexual contact. Karpolev's narrator finds herself a woman alone, an ocean away from her family, which is different from Karpolev herself, who had many family members nearby. She associates freely with young men without any parental supervision, and the only protection she has against their unwanted advances is her own quick thinking, much like the Karpolev who describes herself in the photography studio, that she has only herself um, to, to rely on. Karpolev's novel reflects the excitement, the anxieties, and the intergenerational conflicts of her moment. Rather than reveling in their newfound freedoms, the book exposes the not-so-hidden dangers of women participating in a more sexually permissive youth culture. Karpolev demonstrates the double standards to which women are held even as they desire the status and economic stability of marriage while trying to navigate the uncharted dating scene that included extramarital and premarital affairs. It might not sound like it, but Diary of a Lonely Girl is actually a really funny book, too. Although the narrator is stuck between a rock and a hard place, the way that she wrestles free is by deprecating her landladies and lovers through her sharp wit in the pages of her diary. And we, the readers, benefit from her incessant eye-rolling. The novel itself was widely popular. One way I know this is simply the fact that after the novel was serialized, it was published in book form. And as a result, Karpolev became a regular contributor to Die Wahrheit, to The Ladies' Garment Worker, and to other New York papers. The diary was her first foray into writing serialized novels, which would become a specialty of hers. As early as 1917, before the diary appeared in book form, Karpolev had already begun her second serialized novel, Die Farfirte, about a woman who was led astray. Here are some cool pictures. There's also a lot of great pictures of her because she had family in photography. She continued publishing short stories, reportage, and serialized novels in Die Wahrheit until 1920, when her situation appears to have become more tenuous. In 1925, she left New York for Boston in search of work, where she records that she published about 50 editorials for a newspaper that she found to be provincial and that did nothing to bolster her reputation or readership. I showed you that list of everything that she ever wrote, but there's a line that says, about 50 editorials for this Boston newspaper, <laughs> instead of t saying what they are. Um, as a result, she published this slapstick style uh, novella, a provincial newspaper, about a woman writer and editor who was hired as a staff writer for a poorly managed provincial newspaper and is exploited and ill-treated. So one might assume that there's some autobiographical content in the novel, though it appears to have been exaggerated for comic effect. Oh, there's the Diary of a Lonely Girl. Here we go, provincial newspaper. 
Um, the Yiddish writer, and it first appeared in, um, it, it also first appeared in, uh, in Die Gerechtigkeit, which is a, a newspaper, and then later in, um, in book form. The, the Yiddish writer who's the main character of Karpolov's a provincial newspaper is, like Karpolov, already an established writer whose name draws readers to the newspaper. She's recruited, and as she explains with a refreshingly unap unapologetic self-confidence to the editor who recruits her to the newspaper, my novels are widely read. Having accepted a position with wages so low she's embarrassed to say the sum out loud, Karpolov's protagonist packs her bags and foots her own bill for her train ticket to New York, uh, from New York to Boston to work in this, for this newspaper. There she finds editors who care more about sales than about the quality of their writing, demeaning working conditions, and a community of Americanizing potential readers who want nothing to do with Yiddish. So here's just a little excerpt. The first issue of The Pathfinder. At the top, front and center, in large, bold font, were the words, start reading the exciting, wonderful, interesting, and realistic novel, Both of the Sexes, by the famous and beloved great authoress and member of the editorial staff of the Yiddish Pathfinder, my name followed, today. And then another ad announcement, read the editorial by our own very great authoress, written especially for the Pathfinder. After that, in bold font, the editorial itself appeared, then my picture, over which and under which were a description of all the marvelous things that the great authoress will write in the future. Then there was an invitation to write to her for advice about family life, children, love, misfortunes with love, of course, no one has questions about happy love, and anything else. She will answer any question. Write the question clearly and legibly on one-sided paper and send it to the address printed below for the women's pages of the newspaper. You won't regret it. How nice. A substantial advertisement, but it was a bit much. I looked at the newspaper, and I looked at the others who were also looking at it. The office girls exchanged meaningful glances and smiled kindly at me. One of them came up to me and asked if I was happy. The whole paper is taken up with me. I am so important. Everyone is talking about me. They say I must earn a lot of money. Why, if I were so famous in an English newspaper, I'd be making a fortune. Why don't I write in English? I explained to her that English readers have enough writers. We have too few. If the English newspapers like my writing, they can translate it from Yiddish. I feel more at home in Yiddish. Yiddish is the language I love. But it doesn't pay, she retorted. She is the bookkeeper. She knows what she's talking about. She knows exactly how much money I'm earning. I find that unpleasant. <laughs> but I say to her, money isn't everything. When I write in Yiddish, I am helping in the development of the Yiddish language. And that is more important than, is Yiddish a language, she asked and quickly offered her own answer that she didn't know since she didn't know any Yiddish. None of the office staff knows any Yiddish. The whole newspaper is as incomprehensible as if it were written in Chinese. They brought it home to see if one of their parents could read it for them and tell them what it's all about. Aside from the Russian-speaking intellectuals, the English-speaking ones for whom the newspaper should be near to their heart are actually far from interested. The former aren't interested in the newspaper because they don't like it. The latter don't like it because they don't understand it. So who will read it? Who are we publishing for? There wasn't enough time to settle the question of how the, new, how the newspaper would be read. All of my time would, had to be devoted to writing it. The novel, the editorials, and everything we needed, quote, until the newspaper can stand on its own two feet. All of the editorial tasks, large and small, that were needed to fill its empty columns. I'll just pause and say this gave me great delight to translate as an editor <laughs> who does quite a lot of uh, uh, various and sundry tasks. A new daily newspaper with few advertisements needs a lot of material for publishing. And when the entire editorial staff consists, consists of three people, not only do they have to edit their sections, they have to write the whole thing themselves. So as you can see from the passage, Karpolov addresses with humor the frustrations of her workplace and career, providing the kind of detail that bring these frustrations to life for us a century later. After the Boston newspaper, on September 1st, 1926, Miriam Karpolov left the U.S. to settle in Palestine with her brother and his extended family. In a letter to Chaim Lieberman, secretary of the Isle Parrots Writers' Union, Karpolov wrote about the upcoming journey and made it clear that it was precipitated at least in part by her frustrations working for Yiddish newspapers, as she described in her novella, A Provincial Newspaper. The Writers' Union, she complains in an ironic round, roundabout turn of phrase, always helped me not to forget to remember that I must understand that writing is an art and not a job, and left me free to enjoy my freedom so that I could depend on being independent. 
In other words, Karpolev did not have, a, have steady employment, despite her many years writing for Yiddish newspapers, which, as she points out, I have so honorably served for more than 20 years. I've earned a jubilee celebration, right? Feeling slighted and undervalued, and with the promise of sharing in her brother's passion for the Zionist settler movement in, on the horizon, she left America behind. Uh, here's her letter to Chaim Lieberman. Lieberman. Um, the chapters of the memoir that I translated and published in this volume, Provincial Newspaper and Other Stories, um, are the first seven chapters of what presumably was a much larger manuscript detailing her time in Palestine, but unfortunately only the first seven and a half chapters of this manuscript remain in her archive in Yivo. Maybe she didn't write the rest, or maybe it was lost. These chapters focus largely on her arrival and first impressions, as well as her observations of her travel companions. In the memoir, Karpolev represents, through her various family members, competing ideological commitments vis-a-vis -vis settlement in Palestine. Karpolev's uncle Shmuel sees his pilgrimage to the land of Israel as a religious one. He plans to take part in the study of sacred texts in Jerusalem, and he looks down on modern Zionist accomplishments such as the building of Tel Aviv. The rest of Karpolev's family, however, do not have religious aspirations, and they hardly set foot in Jerusalem, setting their sights on new areas of settlement such as Tel Aviv and the Carmel neighborhood of Haifa, and the modern apparently secularized Zionism that they represent. Still, Karpolev is skeptical of labor Zionist culture, as represented particularly by her, uncle, her cousin Moshe, who insists on being called Moshe instead of Moshe, like he was at home, and she spells it out, to be clear. Um, Karpolev herself is devoted to Zionism, but as with all her ideological commitments, she approaches politics with a grain of salt. When her cousin Moshe takes her on a tour of Tel Aviv, she does not wax ecstatic for the newly erected buildings. Moshe pointed at the buildings. It's like they grew here overnight. Look at them, nice, right? My brother and his wife nodded in agreement. Very nice, but I wanted to know why they, the buildings that is, were so exposed to the outside without any awnings or front yards. They looked rather prosaic. Not enough stores and too many little storefronts here. It makes the whole thing look cheap. I didn't need to say anything more. Moshe and with him Aaron were furious with me. Karpolov sees the flaws in the city that is only half built, and in pointing them out, she takes the wind out of the sails of Moshe's self-congratulatory triumphalist Zionism. Later on, she allows Moshe to bloviate on his racist attitudes toward Arab workers or his certainty of Jewish success, and Karpolov gives her character the opportunity to demonstrate that his enthusiasm for the cause has pushed him ad absurdum. And this is a strategy she does in many of her novels where she's making fun of men. Uh, she just lets them talk for too long. Um, and so she has these kind of classic mansplainers. And as a reader, it's very, very frustrating. Why is she giving them so much space until she gives them too much space and you realize that it's a, it's a, a joke in itself. Um, and so it sort of exposes the chauvinism of the Zionism he espouses. Karpolev herself is certainly not exempt from chauvinism and racism. And whole passages of the memoir deal in troubling racist and orientalist representations, depicting Arabs as lazy, slovenly, and unsanitary. It's important to note that Karpolev's, Karpolev's racism in the text, particularly because she sees herself as outside of the more ideologically strident voices. Yet as a Westerner settling in the so-called Orient, she succumbs all too easily to prevalent Orientalist sentiment. You can see this is a tapestry that she made of her, of, uh, of her time in Israel. She was also very into needlework. Three years after her arrival in Palestine, having failed to make ends meet, Karpolev returned to the United States. In 1949, in a letter to famed poet Ida Maza, Karpolev confided that she hoped her health would allow her to return to Eretz Yisrael, though as far as the archival record shows, that hope was never realized. Upon their deaths, the Karp uh, Miriam Karpolev and her brother Jacob both left their estates to the Jewish National Fund. In 1930, her writing career in New York seems to have picked up somewhat, and she published several novels and short stories, but without a sustained source of income or reliable publishing opportunities. It appears that she also tried to break into English language publishing at that time, uh, self-translating to seek new audiences, but with little success. Uh, she only has maybe one or two things that are published in English at all. It took her a while to land on her feet, but eventually Karpolev was hired as a staff writer for the newspaper, The Forverts, in 1934. 
And this was a major break for her. She once again had a steady income as a writer and in a well-circulating newspaper. And for several years, she published short stories and, and novels and observations in that paper on a weekly basis. Each of these stories is attentive to lively dialogue and ends with a tight, tidy resolution. Many of them are attuned to the experiences and love lives of older women, divorcees, and widows, whose romantic decisions are also pragmatic ones about the kind of domestic labor and living situations they want to pursue. I just read one recently that I hadn't read before called Half a Pound of Meat, which is all about a, a woman who uh, is embarrassed to order meat at a butcher shop because she can't afford as much meat as the other women um, in, who are coming into the shop. And so just very like small observational stories that are extremely tight and, and, um, and beautiful. The stories are, were written to be read around kitchen tables. They reflected the daily lives and interests of Yiddish newspaper readers. And they showcased a broad range of themes from internal classism and racism within the Jewish community to the performative hysterics of an overbearing wife. Um, and they're, they're each, they're very, each is unique, but each features this kind of assertive voice that readers knew to expect every time they saw Karpilov's byline on the printed page. In 1938, she left the Forverts to go to Bridgeport, Connecticut to take care of her brother, Jacob. So she was only working for the Forverts uh, for four years um, uh, to take care of her brother, brother, Jacob, and his ailing wife, Rebecca or Becky. Um, and after Rebecca's death, facing her own health issues, Karpilov continued to live in Bridgeport, although her letters to friends demonstrate that she disliked living there and felt removed from the lively world of Yiddish letters that she was used to inhabiting. A short story by Miami-based Yiddish writer Telush about Karpilov in this period describes her as a has-been Yiddish writer unfulfilled by her provincial life in Bridgeport, though she herself disliked this description and denied its veracity. She continued to publish intermittently, the last publication I was able to find of hers is dated 1945. And until her death in 1956, she maintained a correspondence with many friends in the Yiddish writing world, wrote about plans to publish her collected works, to improve and publish several novels, and to write her own life story. But she also expressed frustration that her poor health made it difficult to realize these projects. This is a letter that she wrote in 1956, uh, 1955, the year before she passed away, uh, to her friend Rose Schomer Bachelis, where she says, I have all these unpublished novels. I want to, to polish them. I have all these plans. Um, and you see she's writing in English there. In some ways, um, Carpa Love's story is one of remarkable success. It's about a woman who uses, used her sharp, sarcastic pen to win fame and financial independence, despite women having fewer opportunities within the Yiddish press. Diary of a Lonely Girl is a primary example of the success because it was so widely read and enjoyed. In some ways, Carpa Love's story is about her need to scramble and her concern and even anger about the lack of interest in her writing and ultimately about her obscurity as her writing lay largely unread and unexamined after her death, despite its popularity in her own lifetime. But more and more, I think it's also a story about the long literary life of a writer, the way that legacies can grow and change depending on who happens to turn their attention to a writer, who reads, translates, writes about, and cares about a writer. Which is to say, Carpa Love's story has extended into a story about me and my career in literary recovery, and also maybe it's a story about you as people who are learning about Carpa Love now and who can integrate her life and work into how you understand Yiddish literary history, American literary history, and simply what it means to be defiant, feisty, and skeptical in the face of life's absurdities. So it's my hope that this translation work will restore her literature to its proper place within American uh, Jewish literature, and that in reading her, scholars will also discover a fuller sense of how difficult it was to write about and largely for women in a publishing world written, uh, run by men, and how valuable such writing can be to our fuller understanding of what Yiddish literature was and is. And I'll leave you with some fun pictures of Miriam Karpala. Oh yes, question time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. A couple of questions. One, uh, so in her archive, there are letters that she wrote, right? Yes, there are some. There are a lot of letters written to her and oh, some yeah. that she wrote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does include some of her. Yeah. Um, so she, at the toward the end of her life, she was living with her brother, Jacob, who some called Nuck. And the vast majority of the correspondence that is in the archive that's from her is to 
Rebecca, Jacob's wife, and to Jacob. Uh, uh, and so we can kind of see both sides of that exchange. Some of them are also to Halpern, who I don't really know who he was to her, but he also lived in Bridgeport and he was part of, so maybe he was friends with Jacob, I'm not really sure. Um, so yeah, so we, so I have sort of both ends of that correspondence. And have you found letters of hers in other writers' archives at Evo or elsewhere? A handful. So uh, Rose from Rebatchelist, there's two letters. There's one in Ida Maza's archive. There's two to Bertha Kling. Um, her archive, there's two archives of hers. One is in Connecticut and it's much smaller. And there, there's some correspondence from Glatstein. So I don't know if she was writing to him. Um, so yeah, I, I haven't found that much, but there's a few here and there. Yeah. So the tapestry, is that a picture or the actual tapestry? Uh, that's, that's the tapestry. It's a picture of the tapestry, but, um, yeah, that's... Is it, is it preserved someplace or... Yeah, so her, her great nephew has it. Um, I have a few of them in my house of her tapestries because her great niece who lives in San Francisco, uh, sent me, back when people used Twitter, sent me a message, a direct message over Twitter saying, I have some of these things in my linen closet that my great aunt Miriam made. Would you like them? And I said, yes, please. Um, and so I have, I have three of them hanging on my wall in my house um, and one that's a challah cover that I have as well. So yeah, she was, but it seems like she was, she did this all the time. And also in her memoir, her Israel memoir, she writes about um, like setting up her room in her hotel in, in Palestine and that she, um, to make it feel like home, she hangs a, um, a needlework uh, landscape with a cow and some that her sister made. So it must have been kind of like a family thing. And also in her play, which was written in 1909, one of her first things that she wrote, as she describes the opening scene, which presumably is supposed to be her childhood home, she describes there's three portraits. There's Montefiore, Herzl, and I can't remember, some rabbi. And then there's uh, needlepoint um, landscapes. So it must have been a big part of her, her life. And then the other question is, as um as you were talking in the beginning, um, one of the things you read, I thought I heard some language that I had seen actually in a play. So the question, because I'm at, well, you, you know where I was born. So um, so part of me was wondering, did somebody else get to some of these, quote, untranslated stuff and then use maybe some of their language and some of their actual plays? So I don't, I don't think so, but I think she's writing things that maybe kind of it was in the air, like it, it, her language is, is um, there were a lot, of, a lot of other people who were writing similar kinds of things. So just to give an example, uh, in her 1909 play in, in Shurim Teg, one of the first things that happens is a matchmaker comes into the house to uh, propose a match for this family and the scene could be straight out of Fiddler on the Roof. It's like this kind of too talkative matchmaker who says he's, good, who's, he's out of breath and he's like, do I have a match for you? And it, it really feels like the first, the opening of Fiddler on the Roof. And, um, and he says, don't, you know, modern kids these days, just don't tell them that the matchmaker set them up. And then there's this kind of misunderstanding that, uh, that happens. It, so I just think that these were, Sort of common themes and ideas. Shana? Did she take up Hebrew at all when she lived in Palestine? So I don't have any writing of hers that's in Hebrew. It might exist. Um, my sense is that she might have understood some Hebrew. Uh, she quotes some songs that some labor Zionists are singing. I think she you know, was sort of like, a, she was around a lot of Zionists for sure. Her brother was really, really um, uh, prominent in, as a Zionist. Um, but um, I think my sense is that she was quite, had a strong allegiance to Yiddish. Several of her characters say, not just the one that I quoted, but there are other ones as well who kind of say like, I'm Dafka, a Yiddish writer. I believe in the Yiddish language. Uh, and so, um, though she later on starts self-translating into English, um, I do brew. Well, it feels like the world that you kind of, the story that you told, it feels really like a closed circuit of just like a Yiddish writerly world. Yeah. And she's clearly really self-reflective about being a woman in that world. Yeah. But I'm wondering if she's self-reflective about being a Jew in the world. Um, because it, it almost feels like it's could have been an Italian woman, right? Like any kind of immigrant um, who, who's 
first language is not English. Yeah. Yeah. There are like moments where she references like specifically Jewish, let's say, ritual practice. Um, and there are also things about it that are, feel particularly Jewish to me because they're about the kind of like diaspora situation of, of Jews. So there's a story about, she writes a story about a girl who goes to Paris on vacation and ends up kind of hanging out with this Soviet emigre family. Um, and so there's like various kinds of care. She has um, a story about um, it, that, sorry, that happens in um, my kid's bedtime <laughs> that, that, uh, that happens uh, in, in Palestine that's about her interactions with a Yemenite woman who's getting married. So like various figures, but there's not so much, there aren't very many non-Jews in her stories. And I kind of feel like, as you say, like this self-contained world, I think that that was her world actually, that she maybe didn't have a lot of friends or interactions outside of the Jewish community, specifically because her, her career was as a Yiddish writer. And so uh, everyone that she was going into, you know, work and seeing every day uh, was a, was a Yiddish, Yiddishist. And then her, and her brother with his Zionist world. That was really fun. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've been thinking about this word authoress, yeah. and I'd love to hear you talk more about it. You know, does was it her only option to call herself an authoress? Were there were there women writers who were not authoresses? Yeah. Was there was Dorothy Parker? I also love it that we talked about Dorothy Parker. Poetesses. Yeah. I was thinking about poetesses, so, right? So, like, was Dorothy Parker an author? Yeah, so Editrix, you know, that's another option. Like, um, Editrix. Lori Harrison Kahan writes a lot about the, the girl uh, journalist. There were other terms circulating in English for a, a, a woman writer, a lady writer, um, a, a, girl, a girl writer, a girl journalist. Um, and I think she picked authoress on purpose. And part of it is, I think, because she was a, uh, English was her second language and she, she wrote it rather formally. So her, a lot of her English, she, she, she self-translated um, Judith as well. And I found after I translated it, I noticed that in her, I didn't found, I had noticed that in her archive was her own handwritten self-translation of Judith. And I did a kind of side-by-side -side comparison and her translation is so, I'm, um, it's, it's very elevated and flowery. It's the language of a person who like is extremely precise, maybe is picking up English from a lot of reading. And I kind of, authoress feels outdated even for her moment. It's a little bit older. And I kind of wonder if maybe she was reading it more than she was hearing it. Um, and that actually girl writer or lady writer or something, woman writer would have been uh, more, I don't think Dorothy Parker would have called herself an authoress. But she might have called herself uh, a woman writer or something like that, or a girl writer. Yeah. What are the options in Yiddish? How is how is writer gendered in Yiddish? Schreiberin, Schriftstellerin. Uh huh. Yeah. Always, oh, or is there is there a movement? I, I... There's Freudian Schreiber. Yeah. Is there a point where women start to want to be just a Schreiber and not a Schreiberin, um... or does that? Does that only happen much, much later? I, my sense, I mean, I don't know, but my gut tells me it happens much later. Um, as often as the case, like Yiddish tends to be a little bit, um, I, I mean, I think because the language is more gendered, right? So um, uh, it maybe follows that then the, the, um, the terminology is a little bit less flexible. It's harder to, um, to turn it into something non-gendered. Yeah, I mean, I really wonder if there's also other um, ways in which uh, writing is gendered. Like, is she uh, is she coming from a place where she's interacting with Polish Russian literature? Yeah. And are there... yeah, and for sure, she's reading she's reading a lot of Russian literature. She was literate in Russian. Her in in her archive, there are a couple of sort of juvenile poems written in Russian. Um, but then she, I don't think she continued writing in Russian after that. Um, and but she references so she there's a line in Diary of a Lonely Girl that I think is really funny where the the main the main character goes to the New York Public Library and she picks up a book and the, one of the guys who's interested in her says what are you reading, and she says um, I'm reading War and Peace I love it in the Russian I wanted to see what it sounded like in the English and I was like people you know like talk about this as being such like a like a lowbrow book but like it's a book about someone who was extremely educated 
Um, so yeah, so it could even, you know, some of these uh, um, questions about what, why it's authorist, maybe it's more related to uh, exposure to Russian as well. So I, I have a comment maybe that's kind of a question. It, it sounds to me though, as, I'm, as you're talking about her, that she was still in a very protected environment, right? So, um, and the reason I say that is that, was that her with the chair saying, yeah, and so I, 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 I would think that, that that somehow or another there was some protection there that she could still lift the chair up in the 1920s and say, if you don't get away from me, I'm going to hit you with the chair. That, that there was somebody there to protect her. Right. Well, I guess I kind of wonder, I also kind of wonder, did it happen or did she write that? Right. Because she's because this is that comes from an article that she published in the newspaper. Right. And maybe it's about a kind of creating a persona. And she also has in Diary of a Lonely Girl, there's a lot of there's more than one time when there are kind of like near rape scenes uh, where the the narrator um, like scratches the man or like runs out of the room and slams the door. And like there's a kind of like physical bravery, um, which maybe it happened, maybe it didn't happen, and maybe it's her way of um, like creating that possibility. So yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to know. So I'll ask a question. Um, the newspaper novel is something that people write a lot about, mm -hmm. and it's something that's been theorized. It's something that kind of re is a part of a reconceptualization of Yiddish literary history, right? That we think we have Yiddish books, but actually there was so much more mm -hmm. that was written for the newspaper. Yeah. Then you have this other body of material, which are these manuscripts that you're finding, you know, in the archive, this unpublished material. So I'm curious if you have a kind of methodological distinction in terms of how you approach mm -hmm. them, and also how this difference reflects on your overall project of recovery and the argument that you're trying to make about what happens with Yiddish women's voices. Yeah, so I think I started with Diary of a Lonely Girl, and um, when I did, I didn't know that Miriam Karpilov was a famous writer. I just, uh, it was a, actually kind of a search box fluke that I ended up with this, um, with this book. Um, but I have become convinced that it is, was her most famous book and that it was very, was famous. Um, and what it means to recover a book that at least in its time was famous um, and think about like how ideas circulated, I do think is different than looking at the book, uh, looking at the um, handwritten manuscript that, that didn't get uh, published and is something that didn't circulate. But I think in the case of Miriam Karpilov, because she was so prolific, uh, and I haven't read everything that she published, that my kind of gut feeling is that at least some of those ideas were circulating through her in various other, so she has other things that deal with, um, I haven't read anything about partisans in particular, but I have read some things that have um, uh, Holocaust um, themes, and uh, just a handful, very few things, because she wasn't writing that much at that point. Um, so. So kind of yes and no. On the one hand, you look at it and you say, well, this is like part of the ideas that she was putting out in the world in some way, uh, and that her ideas were proliferating and also were similar to the other. I find Yendis Radatsky to be very similar to Miriam Karpilov sometimes. And so um, it's just part of like a, ge a general genre or a kind of uh, a zeitgeist. Um, and I think there's something about Diary of a Lonely Girl in particular um, as a like major work of Yiddish literature that uh, doesn't doesn't get read after its time. Um, so I don't know how much that answers your question, but I think yes and yes and no. Rachel, yeah. um, so you know, you know, you know, I think it's um, in some ways we're starting to answer this, but we've been working on Mary and Pablo for some time, and you gave us this really beautiful, I think you gave us a really beautiful reflection on your legacy and how you've been a part of it and you've seen it change as people have been reading your translations. Uh, have your have your feelings about Marian Carpel changed as you've been working on her? Yes. Um, I have a very intense sort of intimate relationship with Miriam Karpilov. Um, because I, and maybe an over-identification <laughs> because I've been translating her for so much. And also because I think like my own career has become so bound up with her. There was one time, I, I'll call him out. I was, I was at the Yiddish Book Center and, um, uh, and um, I, won't, I won't say who it was, but someone came up to me and said, oh, hi, Miriam. <laughs> 
<laughs> and and I, I embraced it, like, okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so like, the, there is some of, it's a little bit, um, and, and part of what drew me to her in the beginning was I felt like we had very similar sense of humor. And so um, it was easy for me, or easy, whatever. It felt natural to kind of tap into, and I felt like I got her. Sometimes when I have students who read her, I have to really explain jokes that seem to me quite intuitive. Um, and so there was this kind of like connection I felt really early on. And that connection kind of like became deeper and deeper as I read provincial newspaper while I was editing in Gavab and like have this kind of like shared experience, if you will. Um, but I really um, had to take a step back when I was translating the, uh, the manuscript um, memoir where she had so much racist language. And I was like, it was this very troubling moment for me when I was like, oh no, like this is my person. Did she write that? And like ha having to kind of like, um, it recognized her as a, as a full person with flaws. And though I am a full person with flaws, they maybe are different flaws. <laughs> and like to be, it kind of like forced me to kind of push myself away a little bit um, and give myself some distance. Um, so, but yeah, I, I think mostly um, I haven't stopped enjoying her. And I thought by now I would have. And I keep saying that I'm done with her. <laughs> you know this. I keep saying I'm done with her. And then I keep translating. Just one more story, though. This one was so good. I just have to. So, um, so I guess eventually that relationship will change. And I'll finally put her down. But I haven't quite gotten there yet. Yeah, I just have a question about the photographs. Like there's, I mean, there's so many great photographs yeah. in the presentation. But early on, there was a slide with three. And one, it's the one where she's in the the beach scene yeah. yeah and i was just curious like i feel like the tone of these photographs is inscrutable to me <laughs> in 2024 <laughs> i'm just curious like are these publication shots are oh, these no, for they're friends not. what's they're, what are these? Uh, these are um this is a studio photograph these are all studio photographs um yeah I'm not sure. I think there might be some retouching in the waist line. Um, uh, but she um, sent them to family members. Um, she would write on the back of them. Um, I, some of them, this one, the middle one, is one that I've seen as a kind of like a publicity shot. But the other two, um, I think, were, uh, were for like private family use. And I think... Um, I think there are so many because her family was in photography, so she could be playful. And there's one with her with a hat and a big boa, and she's going like this. Um, there's like all kinds of. So this is a. You're right. I think it's a very playful one. And at the at the on the back of it, it says like greetings from Coney Island. And then I think the letter says like something like hey catch or something because she's throwing a ball. So there's a kind of like. Um, and I think I think if I'm remembering, it's been a long time since I read this one, but I think she says something about learning how to swim. Uh, so it's like a like a chatty kind of um, it's a Facebook post, you know that kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, I, I think what I was struck by was the similarities between women going into a profession where they're not usually there, and how even now um, there are still too many too many times in 2024 where there aren't very many women. I, I'm in the science. I was in the sciences before I retired, and how even now I still have young people going into the sciences and still as women and still they're they're few and far in between. And that's what struck me as you were talking yeah. about her and she had a good sense of humor for dealing with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean I think that was her strategy was the humor. And and I'll say that like I started tra translating the diary of a lonely girl uh like bef right before the Me Too movement. And as I was translating um the kind of like Me Too movement um um really gained traction. And um, and I was um, dismayed at how relevant the book um, was. And I've been, um, though it's been sort of gratifying that she's helpful to people, uh, it's, it's also very upsetting how many students feel that the diary is so relatable. Yeah. Um, 
and especially I find that the diary in particular speaks to college students because it has a kind of dormitory feel, like she's in these close, in this, in this room and, um, and all this kind of like, she's worried about gossip. What will people think about me? What will my parents, well not her parents, but like what will older people think about me? What will my peers think about me? Uh, I want to impress this person. I don't know what to say. Um, there's so much pressure on me to like have sex with this guy, but I'm not interested. There's all this kind of um, like, it's a very um, unfortunately relatable thing for a lot of, for a lot of students. So that's, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I wish it, it weren't. So I want to make sure we have time for book signing because Jessica <laughs> has agreed to sign some books after the event. So are there any last questions? Yes. Um, it's it's funny to think about her as um, as someone who works with photographs and retouches them, and um, and 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 maybe that I, I guess I'm wondering. It's not a very well organized question. Let me see what I can do. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'm wondering if there's ways in which that kind of um, like lack of authenticity, that kind of like the thing you see is not necessarily mm -hmm. the, the thing in reality. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by that. And, and I'm wondering if that is sort of something she thematizes. And, and then I, I think there's also kind of another question in this, which is I'm, I, I'm fascinated by the idea that in that, um, that kind of provincial Boston newspaper where she's all over every page, they say, Here's our new, you know, authoress, and um, you know she's going to write, and she's you know, she writes editorials, stories, a novel. Write to her, and she'll give her give you advice. Yeah. So this sort of sense that that she that everything can be, uh, she, she will also respond yeah. to your your needs as a um, as a reader. She might she might give you advice. Maybe she'll give you advice in her stories. Like yeah. her stories also are subject to change, sort of like those photographs that are retouched. Yeah. Is is this is this the kind of do, does this sort of weave through her uh, her novels? And is this maybe part of the kind of middle brownness of them yeah. that it's not just like her and her creative vision and some kind of beautiful access to truth that she offers, but rather. She's just in the world responding to stuff. Yeah. So I have a couple of different things to say about that. One is that um, like she's very interested in hypocrisy. And I would say if like one of the th things that she's most interested in is hypocrisy and especially small hypocrisies, like hypocrisies in interpersonal relationships. Uh, someone who says that their name is Moshe, even though she knew him as a child, is Moshe. And like, what does it mean to, do, you know, these kinds of like sm little things. Um, and so maybe that is related to this um, kind of like, painting over people's waistlines to make it just a tad smaller or that kind of thing. Um, it's like such improbable wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I do think there's, there is some of that. Um, to the question, to the point about the writing to and fro, I don't, on the one hand, I don't think that a lot of her writing is like, has, I don't think that she wrote advice columns very, really. Uh, she did write a lot of jokes, I think, uh, and, a, and a lot of like little tidbits. Uh, and she wrote some sort of like, early on, she was also writing articles about particular places and institutions. Uh, so like a school for the blind, and this is my report about, you know, what I saw there. Um, but I think that particular quote is about this kind of jack of all trades. She's doing everything, every department. So like the Bintel brief is kind of the known uh, advice column. And so it's kind of like just kind of listing all the things that are in the newspaper and how she's doing all of them. Uh, but um, the character in the novel uh, is recruited because she's famous and then they put her to work doing things that she's not famous for. Uh, so I think that's kind of what's going on there. But I do think she has a kind of like every man quality, especially the Diary of a Lonely Girl, which um, the narrator doesn't have a name and she doesn't have a specific, you can't trace where she lives. She lives in an apartment somewhere and the people she dates are A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. And so there's this kind of like, she could be any young girl that you meet on the street or not so young. She keeps talking about how old she is. So maybe she's like 25. Um, like, and she could be anyone and she stands in for what the working girl has to endure. Uh, and so there is, I think, 
that's part of this kind of middle brow accessibility, uh, relatability, immediacy, uh, which maybe is not about writing to this particular writer, but about this particular writer writes for you, right? Uh, that she's, she writes as one of you. Yeah. So with that, let's thank Jessica.